evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I'm feeling just slightly guilty knowing that tomorrow people will be wondering why the ratings for the World Series games were depressed <laughs> here. It's because we had this great program. And uh, although with luck, the, any fans in the audience will have, should have plenty of time to get to a tube. Uh, thank you for coming. You know, um, um, familiar litany, a cradle of astronauts, cradle of quarterbacks. Well, of course, we're also the cradle of World Food Prize winners. No one out there has two, and we do. And Dr. Gabiza Jetta, where in the world? I saw him already. He's, got, he's here somewhere. Oh, in his typical modesty, he's a few rows back. Uh, and I reached Phil Nelson, uh, our, his predecessor, who hates that he can't be here, but he's, he's uh, trapped on uh, business far from here. Sends his best to everybody. But uh, what better place than Purdue University to welcome and, uh, and seek the uh, insights of a World Food Prize winner? Um, uh, en route to that prize, um, our, our guest tonight, Kathy Bertini, said a lot of firsts. She was the first woman to head the UN World Food Program. She was the first American to head that program, and is only the third was only the third woman to head any uh, UN uh, program of its of its uh, scope and dimension. So, she's been a pioneer in in many ways, and uh, of course has had the I'm sure enormous uh, fulfillment. Um, that we might all envy of, of knowing that she has saved the lives and improved the lives of millions and millions of people through the work she was uh, able to do. So uh, I just can't tell you what a, a pleasure it is and what I think an appropriate uh, evening it is for Purdue to welcome um, my old friend and World Food Prize winner, Kathy Bertini. Thank you. So as is our usual practice, I've uh, formulated a few uh, uh, gentle questions for <laughs> Kathy, and then, uh, but you'd be thinking about your own, and after I've run through a few, uh, we hope that you'll take over the, the uh, questioning and guide the discussion for the bulk of the, uh, of the evening. And I think, yes, as usual, we have microphones there and there, so... Starting in a few minutes, the braver of you souls should, uh, should claim a place in line. So uh, can we just start? She wouldn't want this, but uh, let's do it anyway. I want to just hear about you a little bit. I'm, as I understand it, you knew from probably uh, first grade on that you were going to be the head of the World Food Program. And <laughs> through, right. Right? right. And planned for it every step right. of the way. Is that how it works? Absolutely. Absolutely. And everybody does that, right? Yeah. It's all got it planned. <laughs> well, if, if it wasn't quite that way, how was it? When I was 15 years old, I went to a seminar for high school students interested in government. And it was a five-day seminar at Colgate University. I grew up in upstate New York, so it wasn't very far away. And it totally sold me on, on government and politics. And I decided, instead of being a music teacher, I was going to go into government. So that's where it started, actually. So I went to school at the State University in New York, in Albany, which was in the capital, so I could work in the legislature, work in the governor's office. And then from there, I worked in politics for five years. And then I um, said, OK, I, before I go into government, I need to know something. I, I didn't want to be a 25-year-old who's only been a politician. And I wanted to be able to offer something else. So I went to uh, a public affairs job, because that was the way to translate my political background into learning about corporate. And I worked at Container Corporation of America in Chicago for 10 years. And then, finally, at one point, I said, OK, I better get around to getting to government. I always wanted to go into government. The governor of Illinois had appointed me to a couple of different positions, but I wanted a real job in government. And I wrote to a man in the Reagan White House who I met from the time he worked for Senator Luger. His name was Mitch Daniels. <laughs> and said I was interested in joining the government. And he said, you're just the kind of person that uh, we'd like to have in government. What do you want to do? Oh, OK. Uh, well, I better define something. So what I said was, 
I wanted to be in social services, service delivery, line management. And so uh, he arranged, or somebody, he asked to arrange for, for very, me to have various interviews. And I joined the government as head of the, then the Aid to Families of Dependent Children program, now called TANF, the welfare program, essentially for poor American women. And I went from there after George H.W. Bush was elected, and I knew President Bush, and I knew Clayton Yider, who was chosen to be Secretary of Agriculture. So uh, they nominated me, President nominated me to, for, to be Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, running the domestic food assistance programs. And Clayton knew that it made sense that I'd been at welfare, now to be at food stamps, uh, now called SNAP, WIC, school lunch, and so forth. When I was there, then Clayton said, you know, there's this agency in Rome called the World Food Program, and the U.S. gives about a third of its resources. Now, by the way, it's about 40%, so the U.S. gives about $2 billion voluntarily to about a $5 billion budget this now in 2015 to WFP. So he said, we've been given about one-third of the resources, but we never had an American running the program. I think it's about time we do. And you would be my first choice, but I have to convince Secretary of State Jim Baker that it would make sense to put forth an American because one country can only have so many of these top jobs. So Baker said okay, and they ran a campaign for the Secretary General and the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization to appoint me, and that's what happened. Now I gotta ask you, if you were become that music, if you had become that music teacher, what would you have been teaching? An instrument? I play the clarinet. Do you still? Yes. Uh, I'm in a community band. We call it the old timers band. <laughs> I joined the band when I was very young and now I'm on the older timer end of the band. But uh, yes, I play in the band. And I would have been a high school music teacher. Well, we love music teachers here too. So it's, not too, it's never too late, you know. And congratulations to you, I've told hundreds, thousands of young musicians, don't quit that clarinet you're playing. You're gonna wanna lay it down because you're gonna think I've got this whipped and you're gonna get busy with other things, then you won't pick it up again, as many of us made that mistake. So uh, you what did you play? Uh, I, I, I played badly the trumpet. And you don't play anymore? No, so, but congratulations The band you. couldn't get you involved now at Purdue? Uh, they wouldn't have me. <laughs> <laughs> Very competitive band. Um, so, uh, Kathy, uh, your, your main uh, mission, of course, was feeding millions of hungry people. But uh, as you did it, you, you really did break some new ground for women, um, is my understanding, both uh, inside the agency itself, but also out in the field where the service was delivered. Can you tell us a little about that? Because I think uh, that we're in a very different place now because of you. Thank you. Uh, well... First of all, when I got to WFP, I looked at the statistics for, of all of our international staff, what percentage were women and what percentage were men. And the, the female percentage was 17%, one seven percent. Mm -hmm. And the UNICEF and UN High Commission for Refugees numbers were 35, 38%. And I asked my new colleagues, why weren't our numbers more like their numbers? And they said, well, because we do guy things here. So I said, what are you mean guy like eat? things? We eat, yeah, <laughs> eating, well, <laughs> I guess that's a guy thing. Well, I, I'll, talk, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so guy things are trains and trucks and planes and ships oh. that we needed to move the food. And I said, you mean there's no women in those fields? I don't believe it. And when people tell you, oh, there's no women, you know, we, we can't, have any, we don't have enough women in this area because there aren't any. That's a baloney statement, mm -hmm. please, it's a baloney. You'd go out and find women because there's women in every field now. And thanks to some of the kind of work that you're doing here, Mitch, and your leadership on STEM, for instance, and there's gonna be a lot more women in those fields too that have been guy places. But, uh, uh, so I said, we'll find them, we'll find them, and we did. So the number by the time I left was 39%, mm -hmm. that was the percentage, uh, but, one of the things we ended up doing, it ended up being mission driven. It wasn't just because she said we needed more women. What happened was we said our mission, first of all, we didn't have a mission statement. So we created a mission statement. We move food around, we have all this food aid, but for what? 
And really the reason is to end hunger in the places that we target where we think we can make a difference. So if the mission is to end hunger, how are we gonna do that? We're not just by moving food, people have to eat the food. So who cooks the food? Well, in the developing world, virtually everywhere, it's women. So if women are cooking the food, and by the way, they're also finding the water and the firewood and, and, or growing the food, working in the fields while they have babies on their back, taking care of their children, milking the cow in the morning and at night and uh, taking the milk into the co-op. And I mean, they're doing everything, then getting home and cooking their meals. Somehow we need to find a way to partner with the women because they're the ones that are really going to end hunger if we help them a bit with our food aid. So it became mission driven. Once we said that, then we said, okay, now we need to consult with the women. We need to find out what they need. And when we didn't, we made big mistakes. Like in Rwanda, in the refugee camps in, in then Zaire, we sent hard kerneled corn. It took them three times as long to cook that mm. than it would have if we had ground it before they got it for instance. Or in Angola, we're in areas where uh, farmers wanted to go back to work in, in fields that had been recently demined in, in, during the war. They asked, we sent them hoes. Hoes, H-O-E-S. <laughs> Not these. <laughs> and I gave this, I, I mentioned this once in New York City and people thought something oh. else. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but they, so, so they, so we sent them hose, and the hose looked like a hose that I have in my, in my uh, garage, that you may have in yours. So it's a long wooden pole, and then it meets at a 90 degree angle, right, a, a, a rectangular spade. There were a whole lot of them lined up against the fence in this community, and I said, what's wrong with those? They said, those are male hose. Now, did you know in Angola there's a gender differentiation in hose? I did not. You didn't know that? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, no, I didn't know that. So, so we, um, so I said, what's a female hoe? Well, they showed me. It's a shorter, does, who knows, does anybody here know? They're all these great, there's a man here who knows this difference. So it was a shorter pole, and it met kind of a pointed, shovely kind of spade at a less than 90 degree angle. And to use it, you didn't stand up like a hoe, you know, because a hoe in my garage is like a rake almost, the way you yes. use it. But these other hoes, you have to squat down in order to use it because uh -huh. it's closer to the ground. And the women preferred it because they had babies on their uh -huh. backs. And it was less That's back breaking so... to do this this way. Who knew? We didn't, we didn't have any women on our staff to ask the question mm -hmm. beyond, oh yeah, send hoes. So those are some of the ways in which we, we changed. And we ended up uh, organizing leadership groups so that we could hear from women because women aren't the mayors, they're not the city councilmen, they're not the one that goes to meetings. If you show up in the town and, and say, okay, we're here for a meeting in order to help give you agriculture advice, who comes? It's a man's job to go to the meetings, generally speaking, mm -hmm. of course. So um, we had to find ways to reach the women. In South Sudan, where we dropped food out of the back of big C-130 airplanes, we worked with the chiefs in order to have a majority women in each, in each community uh, on the committee to decide who was gonna get the food. In Latin America, we worked with mothers clubs, in, in, uh, with it, which were already existing. Uh, in other places, we helped to build some capacity for female leadership so we could have some interlocutors. So we, we, we did a lot in Afghanistan um, when the Taliban came in and said, girls can't go to school, women can't work, women can't go out of the house without a male relative. We had very brave female staff members in Afghanistan who actually went to see the Taliban leadership and said, you know, widows are gonna sit home and shrivel up and die because they can't go out. Right. And we have a solution. We'll have bakeries, the World Food Program will run, they'll send in the flour, you need to approve that certain women could work at the bakeries, you need to approve that the widows can go out daily and get their bread, and they did in seven major cities in Afghanistan, we ran those bakeries. So we did a, a lot of things like that at WFP. Before we change subjects, I'll, I just have to mention one um, footnote to this, which she would never tell you, but uh, I did discover that when she won the World Food Prize, she didn't keep the money. Tell them what you did with the money. Oh, I asked the World Food Prize, uh, rather than to give it to me, to give it to a newly created fund called the Catherine Bertini Trust Fund for Girls' Education, and it's at WFP USA, which is a 501c3, a charitable group in the US that raises money for WFP. 
And so there's this trust fund, and uh, it gives anywhere from one to four grants a year, ten to twenty thousand dollars, to two small organizations all around the world working to get more girls in school or keep them in school. Isn't that a Yeah, the, uh, broadly speaking, not uh, limited to, to food aid, but the, the history of American foreign aid is not a very successful one in terms of ultimate uh, effects and effectiveness and so forth. And um, at least that's my observation. There's been a lot of, a lot of I think, analysis that, that supports that. Um, all too often, uh, progr programs are either poorly targeted, uh, uh, Corruption enters in, uh, dollars or food go, get to the wrong places and so forth. How's the world, the World Food Program, as I've uh, observed, it has a much better record. Um, how do you avoid those kind of mistakes? How do you, how do you optimize, try to optimize the, um, the that every um, uh, bit of assistance that, you, that comes uh, into your uh, stewardship actually gets to somebody? Good question. We, we had, um, first of all, a rule that we have food aid monitors. So one of the entry level jobs for people coming into WFP out of, from Purdue or wherever is a, a food aid monitor. So we have lots of uh, uh, energetic young people who go around and follow the food mm -hmm. and follow the systems. So we, and then we had a, a kind of a, a, an analysis uh, which would tell us where the food was going when and when. And so anytime we thought we had a 2% loss, we would take corrective action. And uh, we, we, one of the things we did was create an office of inspector general. I remember when I said this to a staff member on Capitol Hill one time, he said, well, who made you do that? And I said, nobody. Uh, nobody hmm. made me do it. Well, didn't somebody tell you you had to do it? And I said, no, I just think we need to have an independent reviewer rather than saying, oh, I'm going to you know, send my friend Susie over to check out this out. Well, maybe, maybe she was friends with the mm -hmm. country director. Maybe there's some other problem. So anyway, we had an independent inspector. And he, he saved his, his budget five times over the first year he was there. Because for instance, a, a country director would report that he was losing, losing food, but he couldn't figure out why it was on the marketplace, where he was losing it from. So the inspector would go in and, and, uh, call it, and get the local police and surround the market. And when everybody tries to run out of the market, uh, then he, they grab the guys that did it. And all sorts of things like that. We had, a, we had one, uh, mark, one shop where one of our guys went in and, and saw some WFP cans of food. And we hardly ever had cans of food. They were very valuable. In the, being sold, and he said, I'd like to buy one of those, and the shop owner said, a can or a case? <laughs> um, and uh, so we shut down that country. We didn't send any more food to that country until they fixed it. The problem was, the guy who ran the store was the uncle of the ambassador in Rome. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, we, we, we had a lot of political problems with them, but we absolutely didn't change. The, our biggest challenge, actually, was during my time was in North Korea. Mm -hmm. And we went to North Korea starting in 1995. And if you recall, there was this incredibly devastating famine in North Korea um, in our starting mid 90s for a few years. And we ended up sending a lot of food there, but it Largely was- Largely self-imposed. Uh, yes, it, it, North Korea does not grow enough, can't grow enough food, can't be self-sufficient, but they could, um, Mm -hmm. Yes, they could have better systems, yeah. considerably yeah. better systems. But uh, nonetheless, there are a lot of people starving. Somebody asked me why we were helping them, given the, their view of the government. And I said, um, I'm going to quote a former president of the United States, that Mitch and I knew well, um, President Reagan, who said, a hungry child knows no politics. So it's my job not to assess um, the government, but to get food to those children. And, uh, but it was very challenging to move around because they ran the systems. So we had a really clever guy who created a system based on numbers and numbered every bag, every, every carton, every truckload, and then followed the numbers. 
No, I mean, I think your, the organization has faced this general uh, uh, ethical or even moral question before. You, in many, many countries, by helping the people, you're enabling a regime which is possibly oppressing the, the people. The difference with North Korea is that regime has nuclear weapons and might be willing to use them someday. So it's a, a tough call. Yeah, and the issue is, okay, so do, well, now they're not being, there's almost no one helping North Korea yeah. for that reason. Yeah. But our, our, our issue was in the 90s, okay, nobody likes the government. The government is extremely oppressive. The government has, uh, uh, well, I won't go into the whole litany, but um, do we say, well, they're bad guys and we're not gonna help them? Or do we say we still have the responsibility to help the, the children in that, in that community? And we, um, that's, that's what we opted for. And with a lot of support from the US, from Japan, from South Korea. But uh, interestingly, one time during the Clinton presidency, uh, we had a, there was a uh, hurricane in Cuba. And WP had been in Cuba for some time with general development work. And the U.S. was getting ready to give food for this people that were impacted by this hurricane. Now, this was going to be a big deal because we hadn't done anything like that before. And they had even gone to Congress and got Republican leadership on Congress to say, okay, it was okay. So we were, the WP was going to announce we were going to give this big, have this big program in Cuba. And then the U.S. was going to announce, and we're giving this much, which would have been huge. It would have been huge really important for the Cubans, but much more important geopolitically. Um, and then one of the guys on my staff said, this wonderful man, Neil Gallagher, American, worked at USDA before he came to WFP. He said, has anybody asked Fidel if he'll take the food? Um, I mean, can you imagine if this all happened and then they said no? So um, we, is that Jim Mosley sitting? Yeah, right there? that's who that is. Uh, then one of my colleagues at USDA. Where so, do you think he learned all that stuff? <laughs> uh, so um, we. Um, so anyway, I called in the Cuban ambassador, and asked him, and he was excited. He left huh? excited, and came back two days later and said, no. No, because the official position of the government is the Americans. If, if it weren't for the Americans and the blockade and the, all, all the, the boycott and whatever, uh, we would be much better off mm. and we would be hypocritical to take the food. I said, yes, but the, it doesn't matter those women that are, can't feed their babies where the food comes from. Well, no, nope, it matters to us. Um, I've got a couple more, but it's not too soon for the uh, more inquisitive among you to start stepping forward. Um, let, let, let me ask you a different question about leakage and loss and so forth. So just more, more broadly, you've seen the food systems now in almost every country on earth, and we, we think a lot around here about the fact that uh, we, we can grow enough people to feed everyone, but uh, a, a, a disappointing percentage of it finally makes it to someone's home or table, so uh, there, there are all sorts of uh, factors involved here, uh, infrastructure and storage, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, price controls and dumb problems like that prevent more indigenous food from being grown, uh, tech not, let, not using technology, uh, uh, corruption sometimes. When, when you think about that issue of the uh, loss, uh, which, which ones, which of those factors you think are, are the most important? Well, post-harvest loss is a real serious issue because so much food is produced that is never, never gets to the table, right. never gets consumed. And it's also an issue that doesn't get enough attention. Uh, but I know that at Purdue, there's some uh, really um, good programs to work on uh, packaging mm -hmm. the, the food and killing the bugs. Pick, yeah. pick? Yeah, picks, yeah, storage. Um, so, lady does her homework. Are there are there yeah, are there people here who are involved in that? Yes, um, and uh, uh, but this most of our research money for, goes into the other side of of uh, the um, development of seeds and and the production on the production side, and much less of it goes on the other side in terms of 
uh, post-harvest loss prevention, um, marketing, distribution, all those things. And I, I think that that's a high priority for those great research institutions like Purdue to, to pay more attention to. But um, I think it starts right in the field when um, people are not able to save the crops they have. And when, when, when the crops are uh, abundant and the prices are so low and then, and then well, they're gone and, and mm -hmm. what's left, the prices are so high, and there's no way to either refrigerate or store. Some basic things even like storage and the monitoring of what's in the storage and, and the uh, certifying what's there and what came in first and what c can go out and who's belongs to what if it's a community mm -hmm. storage facility and then keeping this, the food safe in that place. Those are all issues that are uh, critically important to the, to the process and, and many communities don't have it. World Food Program, under my uh, successor now, and, and there have been three people since, since I was there, uh, Jim Morris from Indiana, um, Josette Sharon, and now Earthring Cousin from Chicago. Um, they have a, a program that was funded by the Gates Foundation called uh, Purchase for Progress, where they try to give support to smallholder farmers about these kind of things. How do you deal with the quality of what you're growing? How do you keep it safe? How do you keep it stored? How, how when you make a contract with someone for a future purchase, how you don't sell it to a middleman before mm. then? Um, and a whole lot of issues to try to build the capacity of those smallholder farmers. But it's a, it's, it, it, it's a uh, process that could make a big difference if we did a better job of it. Okay. I think we've got our first audience questioner, please. Hi, good day. Um, my are you hearing me? Yes. Right, good. My name is Travis. I'm a first year PhD student here in Ag Econ. Um, I'm, I'm also from Jamaica, and it's based on that background that I ask these two questions. Um, well, first, given conversations I've had with friends back home, uh, there's a perception that much of international aid goes to high impact areas. Um, so that's areas where impact per capita is higher and operational costs are lower when compared to smaller um, areas such as small island developing states. So my first question is, did you have those challenges and how did you balance those trade-offs? And my second question is, uh, given the significant contributions of developed countries to the UN with resources that small countries couldn't hope to compete with, and your observation of how underrepresented women were, mm. I was just curious to find out you know, how, re how represented are small countries in top UN jobs, and what advice would you give to students like mm. myself who would love to eventually have one of those top UN jobs? Oh, great question. Well, if you're getting a, a, a doctorate from Purdue, you're, you're gonna be in good shape for looking for those jobs. Um, uh, first, uh, to your first question, first of all, there's so much more resources for emergencies, refugees, displaced than there is for development. It's not just in the food aid business. It's across, it's across the board uh, ever since the shift. The shift really came at, at the end of the Cold War and when so, so there were so many changes in the 90s and so many, so many problematic issues in Europe and Africa and elsewhere. And... Uh, and in places like Latin America generally, and, and certainly in the small island states, were not the beneficiary because uh, of those programs, because they're reasonably peaceful. And because they had had, even, even if some of those countries are still relatively poor, they had still had a lot more economic growth than some of the least developed countries, for instance, in Africa. So uh, with the exception of Haiti, most of the countries in our region are considerably better off than, than uh, countries in, in, in many countries, not all, certainly in Africa. So, so there was a shift to some of the other um, countries that were more in need. And yes, there is an issue of capacity and an issue of overhead. And there were a few countries, very small countries, where we ended up having to close our operations because the overhead cost was higher than the actual food cost for the distribution. Uh, that doesn't mean that all development stopped there, but that certainly was the case for um, high volume commodity movement in our case. One of the things that WFP is doing differently is one thing we did then actually with funding from, from the Bush 
41 administration was to create a vulnerability mapping system. And they still exist. You can find this on WFP's website, where they put all sorts of data into a computer and then come up with a, um, a map showing the most food insecure areas of the country. Now, we use that for targeting, but uh, we've also helped countries create this themselves. So a, a country like Jamaica or, could use this in order to develop their own uh, strategies for where would be the biggest need. It doesn't have to be food insecurity. It could be health needs or some other needs. So uh, I think there are, different, there are different technologies that could be used. The other one is that there's much more cash in the system now, not just food and not just in kind. So a lot of donors, um, almost everybody except the US, is giving almost exclusively cash. There's a few exceptions. And I know that um, President Daniels worked on this when he was at OMB to try to get the US to use more cash, actually, um, at, at that time, is much more cost um, effective. But, um, but that's another thing. For instance, the Syrian refugees in Turkey or in Jordan get debit cards, go to a grocery store. So it's, there's a lot of more grocery stores now, um, well-stocked. And then the debit card works like a SNAP card. And then, uh, so that kind of thing could work in a, in a country um, like the ones that you mentioned. So now, jobs. Well, at WFP, you're absolutely right. It's a very thoughtful question. We, we pushed to try to have more women. But at the same time, I realized exactly what you just said, that since our contributions were coming from almost exclusively from Western countries, wealthier countries, I didn't want the population of the organization to, be, to reflect that. I guess would be the best way to say it. And, and so we didn't have any rules. So I eventually made a, um, goals at WFP for hiring. And 50% female hiring, international staff this is, and 40% developing country nationals. I remember some other UN colleagues were annoyed at me that I sent this 40% developing country national staff. Um, kind of quota, I didn't call it that. Uh, and uh, um, they said, well, we, somebody might tell us we have to do it. <coughs> well, that's your problem. Um, but I don't want this to look like all European mm -hmm. men. And uh, uh, we need to have a more diverse program. And we even hired recruiters to find women from the South. I have to tell you now, some years after I left, I left WFP in 2002. I, every once in a while, I go somewhere where I meet some of these people that were hired. Now, to give you an example, uh, I took my class. I teach at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, and I, I, I teach a class on humanitarian action, a class on the UN, girls' education, surprise, surprise, uh, and, um, and other and food security. But I um, took a class to the UN, and I asked OCHA, the humanitarian arm of the UN, to send me a speaker. And I said, please, could you be sure, sure to send me a female speaker, because I have uh, other men on the program. I don't have all men on the program. So they sent me a speaker, a female, a uh, Ghanaian. And she, uh, her name was Kiki Gabo. And she, I didn't know her. And she started her speech by saying, I'm so glad to have a chance to meet uh, Mrs. Bertini. They called you Mrs. no matter, I mean, the Ms. word doesn't work in, uh, in the international community. So everybody says Mrs. If you're married, you're, I guess even if you're old enough to be married, mm -hmm. you're Mrs. Um, so, so anyway, she said, I'm so glad to meet Mrs. Bertini. I never thought I'd have a chance to meet her and say that I always wanted to join the UN. The closest I got was being a tour guide. Um, and I couldn't get a job, and I couldn't get a job. And then I heard that this young American woman at the UN was had hired a search firm to find women from the South, entry level women from the South, and uh, you hired me. And also you hired this, all these people she names. And now she was about to go off to Namibia to be the head of the UN in Namibia. So it's That's really exciting. So there's lots of opportunities for you in the UN. Uh, and, uh, and if you think about the agency heads, for instance, they're, they're from all, all around the world. And in the UN proper, there's usually one American in the secretariat and a couple of them running agencies and um, people from a lot of different countries. It's a great legacy. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I study industrial engineering and I focus on supply chain. I'm a grad student here. 
And a lot of research in the past years is on supply chains for humanitarian assistance and solving food security problems. But all those papers look really good on, pa on just theoretically. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to applying those models in real world, mm -hmm. there's a big gap there. Mm -hmm. So how can this gap be reduced so that it can be actually applied? And my second question being that a lot of positions at World Food Program, even on the logistics cluster side of it, most of the people have political science or public affairs kind of a background to reach to those kind of jobs. How can someone from engineering and technology apply to and be a part of those kind of positions? Okay, I'll, I'll take the second one first. Uh, there are a lot of technical people at WFP, even much more now than when I was there. Uh, there's, and there's a huge transport and logistics component. And so if your background is anywhere close to those, there, there are potentially a lot of positions. But because of all these new technologies, a couple of which I mentioned before, they're look, they, they have hired lately a lot more people with technical background than they have in the past. And um, not for the food aid monitor jobs that I mentioned, but for, but for other jobs that are more technical. The problem is with World Food Program, with UNICEF, and with many other pr programs, they, they, people who are looking just out of school or just after you get your degree, several things. First of all, they're looking for, one, for your uh, graduate degree of some sort. Two is for languages to be f fluent in more than English in a UN language. So, you know, somebody comes and says, you know, well, okay, I speak um, um, Urdu that's not gonna probably get them hired, but if they speak French or Spanish or Arabic or um, Russian or Chinese, Portuguese even, it's not a UN language, but there's enough, there's enough uh, countries that speak it that helps. And then the third thing is some sort of field experience, some sort of experience in the field, because they don't wanna hire people and then have them get somewhere and say, oh, this isn't for me. Mm. So those three are basics, but the bigger problem lately is that they hire, more consultants than, than people in, in real jobs. It used to be that consultants were somebody you hire, you know, I want to have a leader, I want to hire President Daniels because he does just great things at Purdue and I want to have him come and refigure the whole organization of <coughs> be, and I hire him as a short-term consultant. I know he's busy, but I mean, you know, that's, that. but now consultant means a person doing a real job. It could be doing it just along with somebody else who's doing a, international civil servant job. So it's, it's, and the reason why they do that is because their budgets go up and down, so they don't wanna get stuck with mm -hmm. too many uh, long-term staff, so they call them consultants. And it's not so transparent, so it's harder to get those jobs. I tell my students <coughs> that the best thing to do is to uh, intern somewhere and then um, impress them and then get a consultancy, which then hopefully turns into a, a regular job. So anyway, but if you have a, particular expertise, you can look for when they post jobs that might be looking for those kind of expertise, and that's, that's a little bit different. Now that I've spent so much time sending your second question, your first question was? Those are publications that uh, somehow don't match up to the real world. Oh, yes. Uh, research that doesn't. That doesn't. It's not practical, somehow. One of the things that I don't think we do very well as people working on development and humanitarian and also, also on, in our development programs that you referred to before is I don't think we do, I don't think we have it demand driven enough. I think we're more likely to go and say, hi, I'm, I'm from America and I'm here to help you rather than, hi, here I am, but what is it that you need and can I then match that up with, um, with some expertise that I have available. And so I think a lot of times we may sit in a, in a, in a um, lab or something and come up with some great project and say, well, this has got to be good somewhere. <laughs> and you know, I, solar cookers are one of my favorites. Now, I apologize to anybody who's a big solar cooker fan. Um, and, it, but, and I know people are working on this forever, and I know there's been some successes, but I can't tell you how many warehouses I've seen around the world with piles of tin unused or used once solar cookers um, because everybody's got this great idea but they don't field test it with the people who actually see what they really need and what they really want and what they would really use it. So uh, that's what I think we need to do more of and if I might use in another current example, uh, when the new administration comes in, 
soon in January. Um, I'm, it's my hope that the, in the U.S. that we'll put more effort, continue to put more effort on agriculture development. The, uh, President Obama decided at the beginning of his term that he would um, help the country, our country, would help poor farmers in poor countries. And we were at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs really proud of that because we had made proposals uh, to the whomever was going to be the incoming, happened to be President Obama, to, um, to do this, to spend more time on this. And he did. And, he, and then AID created Feed the Future, which many of you know about, and all of that. And they, Raj Shah, who was the administrator, said the, the intellectual underpinning of this was the Chicago Council report. So we were, we were real proud of that and helped them along the way. So we're, we're now hoping and, and putting a plan together that a new administration might use to be able to extend this further. One of the things we're going to say in this plan is we did in the last one, but we're going to say it in a different kind of ways is that we, America, one of the great underpinnings of America and our success in agriculture, which, which pre, was a precursor of our success and so much else, was the creation of the land grant system and the excellence of universities like this one. Uh, in terms of, of its building its capacity and the capacity for Indiana and the United States and in fact the whole world. And we've been, we've been supporting in programs at Purdue and, all, and the other land grants to help send some of our expertise overseas. And we've been doing, a, a, I think, a fine job with the research and with a lot of those projects. But I'd rather have some of this, and I hope we're going to recommend this, to be more demand-driven so that you know, a country could say, you know, we really need more, we really need help in our sorghum production. And we know that Gabisa Ajeta at, uh, at Purdue is a world-class expert in this, and so let's go to him. Rather than Purdue going and saying, hey, hey, here, we have the Anybody sorghum, whether you sorghum? want it yeah. or not, we're going to help mm -hmm. you. So that's the, I, I, I'd love us to do more of that. It's the female hose thing on a... Yes, right. on a big scale, yeah. yes. Those are great questions. Was that responsive? Uh, yeah. Over here. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Taisha. I'm a master's student in agricultural and biological engineering. Um, uh, the whole topic of food aid is very intriguing to me. I'm, I'm from Haiti, and um, mm. so I have a couple of questions for you. Um, so I think we're going through a phase in Haiti where we're thinking, when does aid... Um, when is it effective? And I think, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's been a lot of, uh, from tragedy to, to, to obstacles and for us. And um, what do you think, when we, when we look at um, food aid particularly, um, you know, uh, in the context of whether it is emergency and when countries like Haiti cannot get out of that cycle, um, what exactly, when do you think, um, assistance contribute to economic growth and stop mm. really being where it's at. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm framing this well, but uh, what do you think about that? When do we start moving um, ahead? Um, nobody wants to be dependent, right? Not, no country, no community, no family. Everybody wants to be able to survive themselves and thrive themselves. and. Hopefully, food aid and many other kind of aid is used for that purpose to help people either in an, living in extreme difficulty, or, uh, or people help people to be able to build their own capacity and their own resources, their own livelihoods. That's the whole whole purpose. And if we did that well, we would eventually put ourselves out of business. I think the international community, every facet of it, has failed Haiti. And it's tragic that that's happened in any country, but it's happened right here in our own hemisphere. Um, whether it's, it's uh, development aid, emergency aid, um, um, military uh, uh, peacekeepers, um, uh, and especially governance. And um, uh, I, there's been various efforts over time, oh, let's help Haiti, usually around a crisis, but not always. But um, I think if we, were, if we were to be serious about one thing we should do in, in, in this hemisphere, it would be to uh, work with the people of Haiti to, to find the, the key 
things th that they believe that where the international community could be most helpful and then concentrate on that. I think it's a, a tragic example of everybody deciding what Haiti needs without interacting properly. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm a PhD student at Aiken Biological Engineering, so I have two questions for you. With the production increasing at the cost of the natural resources getting depleted at a faster rate, we know that. We need population to be fed and safe from the natural disasters caused by, caused by anthropogenic activities. In your administration, how you deal with such situations? This is my first question. Second question, being from a country like India, we produce the le we are the leading producers of paddy and wheat all across the world, but lacking storage facilities to store the grains. How will you address this issue in helping such countries like India or some other countries who are the dealing producers, leading producers of some food to assist in reducing losses and having more sustainable agriculture? Uh, really good question. Well, India is, is crucial, successful, um, development of food systems in India is crucial to the feeding of uh, the future because so much of the population is in India and the growing population is in India. One day, if the population trends continue, there, India will surpass China as being the biggest country in the world. And, um, and it's a democracy and uh, it's a capitalist uh, uh, system and there's... Uh, sort of. Sort of, yeah, as I used quotes. <laughs> Uh, and there, but there's, there are huge gaps, huge gaps, and um, in many different systems, and certainly in the ability of Indians to have access to the, to the food that's necessary. And uh, so, so getting this right in India is key. If you look at the, I'm, I'm going to duck though and say it's not WFP's job in the current structure. This organization called Food and Agriculture Organization, also based in Rome, which is that and the UN are the parents of WFP, actually, initially. And they are the ones that are supposed to help develop systems. Now, uh, how, how good their ability is doing that is another, is another question. And, and actually, that brings me to a point to say that I think that we should, we, the US, should ask for a mandate review of all of these organizations because they were created, many of them, right after World War II, for instance. And um, the difference between what it says in their constitution or their bylaws and what they do now are sometimes considerably different. Also, are they still effective? Are they still needed? Um, could they be different? WFP's changing by leaps and bounds and uh, uh, going in a lot of different directions. I, I think at least on the whole food side, uh, we, should have a, we should have an overall review of, of what, what do we need now and do we have it and what do we need to change in order to get there. But that goes beyond your question about India. As far as uh, react, I think reacting to natural disasters, particularly um, earthquakes and is that, was that the question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, the, the UN has, has gotten much more sophisticated on this because they have a lot of um, uh, early warning systems. And they can't warn of everything. They can't warn uh, necessarily of earthquakes, for instance, but they can of droughts and, uh, uh, and sometimes of floods. And they've gotten much better at uh, planning and pre-planning. And sometimes they spend a lot of money planning and then they don't need it, which I consider a good thing. Um, and for instance, uh, during my time when they said there was going to be a big El Nino effect in different places, and I, one of the places it was supposed to have an impact was the west coast of Africa. So we did lots of pre-planning for how we were going to work with the countries in the west coast of Africa, and then we didn't need it because it wasn't mm. bad. But rather that, mm. that, rather have that than, than the other way around. Um, uh, WFP is extremely efficient in these kind of projects. In, in Nepal, after the terrible earthquake there, um, they were very creative about using every sort of transport up into the mountains where there weren't any roads, including hiring the Sherpas who didn't have jobs because the tourists had mm. left, so they hired them to deliver food. Um, so they're, they've always been creative about how to get food. Well, just being, what, being just three days off the plane from India, that's where I got this cold for which I have to apologize. 
uh, every time there I have the same um, reaction maybe others have too. On alternate days, you can be awed by the immensity of the problems, but the next, in the next breath, inspired by the enormous upside possibilities of the Indian people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if those problems can be dealt with wisely. I mean, right. could be the driver of, the next driver of global uplift, so let's hope. Right, and you probably have a lot of alums from India? Yes, three to 4,000, that was the principal reason for the various trips we've made, is to, is to try to make them feel um, uh, b closer part of the Purdue family, and I think a lot of them do. And we're also uh, proud to tell you we have 1,900 Indian students on campus, um, graduate and undergraduate, which is probably more than anybody else, and we're proud of that. So um, we've had a sudden surge of uh, interest and just about enough time. If the questions are, uh, are brief, uh, I think we have, we'll finish right on time. Let's make these the last three. All right. Uh, hello, my name's Ryan. I'm a PhD student in food science here at Purdue. Uh, you talked a lot about how there's a lot more emphasis and resources available for reactive programs. For example, there's an earthquake, let's send food. Can you talk a little bit more about pr more proactive measures that may be in place or may be being planned to be implemented regarding improving the <clears throat> stability or resilience of global food systems? Sure. Sure. That, that's not so much in WFP's purview, but it is part of, for instance, Feed the Future that the U.S. Uh, has invested more money into. And I, the U, if, I'm going to talk about that for a minute from the U.S. policy, is when we were, when we were in government, pol we led with food aid. That was, that was what we were doing. And, and it was important, it's, it's, but it's a Band-Aid, usually especially in an emergency or refugee situation, which is mostly how it's used now, even when it's cash as opposed to food. So now, I think, as a result of the changes in, in, in the Obama administration, and, and Congress also passed a law, uh, the Global Food Security Act. I wish they'd call it the Luger Global Food Security Act, because he's the first one that, Senator Luger was the first one that, that introduced such a bill, but it finally passed this last Congress. To, to essentially say that we should prioritize uh, assistance for, to help with agriculture development. So now I, I think the shift is that the US is gonna lead with helping poor farmers become more productive and food aid is one of the tools um, to help uh, support that in small ways but also help keep people alive in bigger ways. So, um, the assistance is in so many areas. In, let's start with research. And again, the land-grant universities are, are very helpful in this context. There's a, there's a national research uh, or a center in every country. Um, mixed reviews on the effectiveness, but those are really country-based and could be much more supported um, by us collectively. Uh, in order to improve national capacity and actual, national expertise. Um, there, sometimes there needs to be attention to laws uh, uh, to be changed. Ghana, for instance, had a law that only, if somebody may know this far better than me, I might not be saying this exactly the right way, but um, I believe their law said that you could, they could only use seeds that were developed in Ghana. And so, so the law was changed. Kofi Annan was, was influential in helping to get a change. Of course, he is he's Ghanaian. Um, it's so that it could open the opportunities for um, more uh, development in Ghana and their agriculture production. So, so on, there's a lot of issues on the research and the legal side, and then there are issues just with farmers, specifically with farmers. And I, I would refer you to the uh, USAID Feed the Future web website because I think you'll get to see a whole menu of different um, successes that uh, USAID has talked about in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening. I'm Kainat from, I'm a PhD student uh, in the Agriculture Economics Department. And before coming here, I was um, working in the Vulnerability Analysis and a mapping unit of WFP in Bangladesh. Oh. <laughs> so I'm quite excited to meet you today. <laughs> um, my first question is um, regarding the changing role of WFP. Um, so. WFP used to be known as a, an organization, or maybe it is still known as the organization whose primary strength is logistics and emergency delivery. 
I mean, when I used to tell people that I work in the WFPN, they used to say, oh, you deliver biscuits, right? Mm. And I was like, no, I, I have nothing to do with that. Mm. So, and it has come, become now <coughs> an, uh, an organization with innovative programs, food assistance programs, uh, trying to create new ways to have sustainable solutions to, um, instead of just giving out food aid, to have market-based market, market -based food assistant, uh, assistance solutions. Um, also going into nutrition as well, prioritizing it among the uh, three uh, UN organizations which work on food. Um, having said that, what do you see as the biggest challenge for WFP now in this transitory role? Um, and second question is regarding um, uh, the universities and WFP. So do you see that uh, universities can play a role, like research universities, researchers can play a role in designing these you know, uh, new programs, new assistance programs, or do you think it is solely the, it should be confined to the people who are running the programs who, uh, who have field experience? So yes, and those are my two questions. Great. Um, WFP is changing, and uh, it's changing because the technology is changing. It's changing because there's more cash in the system. It's changing um, because uh, it, it, uh, there's such a huge refugee flow that it's, it, it's trying to support in different ways. And um, uh, it's changing because some of the donors want it to change. This week or next week, uh, they have an executive board meeting, which is their governing body. And I would encourage you to look up their, they put out a strategic plan for what they want to do in the future. So especially since you know WFP well. And it's very nice to meet you this way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you might want to look at uh, what they're saying that their next five years are going to be looking like. But it's, it's, it's changed significantly en enough that I think that it's, it's realistic to have a conversation about is this uh, the right direction to go. I don't, I'm not trying to second guess what they're trying to do, but I, I, as I said, I think on the broader perspective, if we looked at all of what we're trying to do, generally speaking, and then take advantage of the expertise of the various institutions, um, that, we, that that might be the, the best thing to do over the long term. Uh, WFP always has been known for its transport and logistic capacity. When I was working on reorganizing WFP, and I had the, the benefit of the man who preceded me, who had been at WFP for 10 years, Jim Ingram, who's Australian, who's written a book called Bread and Stones, if anybody really wants to be a WFP groupie and read this book. It is about um, how he worked during his t tenure to divorce WFP constitutionally from FAO. And it's a good thing he did, because by the time I was there in 1992, the Soviet Union had collapsed in, in December of 91, the Berlin Wall had fallen in 89. We had so many more emergencies. We had to move very quickly. And, um, and FAO was really um, uh, more bureaucratic, let's say. So, um, so the, it, it changed then, and we were able to change it. We had to, we had to concentrate on keeping our, resource, our logistics operation really strong, but at the same time expand everything else. Somebody asked me, um, Mitch, when I when I got there, um, had I ever run an organization like WFP before? And I said, well, I've run a government bureaucracy before, yeah. and I've run a political campaign before. I've just never run both of them in the same mm -hmm. place at the same time. <laughs> Great answer. And, and because, the, because part of it was this development bureaucracy of just going like this, and part of it was, oops, there's an earthquake last night. Let's. Mm -hmm. Do something about it, and it was we had to put put that all together. Yes, there's more of a role for research, um, uh, but the organization has to reach out to to find the place. But as I said, they're hiring more technical people. They're hiring more PhDs in different areas. So I think there could be more of a place. Yes. Last question. Hi, my name is Mohammed. Um, I am a PhD student in environmental and ecological engineering. Um, my first question was better framed by Kainat, maybe because we had a course together. Mm -hmm. So I'll jump into the, my second question. Have you ex experienced a location where would you envision relocating a whole community as a better option than trying to make things work out? Mm. Um, if 
that was like the case, is there any place that you can recall that wasn't suitable for a human to live in? Wow. Uh, except for having to move refugee camps because they were either too close or too far away from a border, I don't think we ever really had to move a community, but there are some small island states in the Pacific who have to think about hmm. this uh, because of the rising water levels. So um, I think that's where I'd go to look at. Um, uh, people who live in, in very stark circumstances, very stark environments, uh, uh, and with no roofs, and um, hardly any water uh, would, pro and no other support or companionship would probably be, except their own family, would probably be the people that I saw that were um, living in the most inhospitable um, situations. So um, anyway, that's, that, 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 was, that was tough, and it was tough. It the first time in, in a job like this when you see somebody, a, a child who's dying of starvation. Um, but then you look around at all the children who are thriving because you fed them. I mean, your organization fed them. And I think that's, that's what I always try to do, and I hope you, that works for you in your careers, no matter what they are, which is to say that you, know, you see some of the failures or you see some of the things you wish you could have done something about but you will have a good and fulfilling career if those are if if you if those are balanced many times over by all the people you are able to serve or all the good things you're able to do or the new science you've been able to bring to the table. I can't think of a better place to end than where your answer just did. And so, Kathy, we want to thank you, of course, for uh, spending that time with us tonight and other uh, and, and other time you're spending on our campus, but more so for leading one of the great humanitarian lives of our time. Thank you so much. Thank you.